You all know Donald Trump was uh, finally indicted for the role he played on January 6th. So this is not just an indictment of former U.S. President Donald Trump. It's also an indictment of the entire legal profession. Five out of six of Donald Trump's co-conspirators are attorneys. That's according to the indictment. One of those attorneys, now we don't know for certain, they, he, Jack Smith hasn't told us who the attorney, who the co-conspirators are. But if you read the indictment and you do a little detective work, you can figure it out. So most likely one of the co-conspirators is this guy, Rudy Giuliani, a former U.S. attorney. Jack Smith, the special counsel, Jack Smith, uh, the special counsel, I would assume really wants to go after Rudy Giuliani for disgracing the U.S. attorney's office. Rudy, by the way, still has not been disbarred. His license has been suspended in New York and D.C., but he has not been disbarred. That's the American legal system. For you to get officially disbarred, first you must incite an insurrection, and then maybe we'll think about taking your law license away. What does it take to get disbarred in America? How is it possible that Rudy Giuliani still has his law license? Granted, it's been suspended. But really? Well, this month, if I could give you any advice, pay attention to Chris Christie. He's going to be on the debate stage at the end of the month when Republicans hold their first presidential debate. Chris Christie, like Rudy Giuliani, is a former U.S. attorney. He was a federal prosecutor. Rudy was a federal prosecutor back in the 80s. He brought down the mob. And former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie was a U.S. attorney who prosecuted Jared Kushner's father and sent him off to prison. Chris Christie is a horrible guy, but he was a U.S. attorney at least a former one, and pay attention to him during the debates because he's planning to assist Jack Smith on that debate stage with or without Donald Trump. Chris Christie isn't going to get booed if Donald Trump doesn't show up to the debate this month. So he's going to make mincemeat out of everyone, not just Donald Trump. He's going to make mincemeat out of every other Republican candidate uh, candidate on that stage who's too chicken shit to call out Trump for his crimes. Now, that's assuming Trump doesn't show up. If Trump's not there, Christie doesn't get booed and he becomes a hero. He just decimates the competition. If Trump shows up, or when he shows up for the second debate, it's going to be a crowded field. But Chris Christie, he knows how to debate Trump. Chris Christie was Donald Trump's debate coach in 2020. And Christie, as I said, is a former U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor, and his loyalty right now, he's part of the Brotherhood, his loyalty is to Jack Smith. And what Chris Christie is going to do on that debate stage is grill Donald Trump like he's never been grilled before. And nobody's better at grilling than Chris Christie. We know he loves to grill. He's going to force Trump into playing to the crowd, the crowd of yahoos. Trump's applause lines, however, when he fires back at Christie, those applause lines will be Donald Trump's undoing, because whatever Trump says to rile up his crowd will be used against him in a court of law, especially in Washington, D.C., when he goes on trial for the role he played in inciting January 6. These debates are going to be a lot different than they were for Donald Trump before. Trump, if you'll recall, the day after a jury found him guilty of raping E. Jean Carroll, and he did rape her, as the judge wrote two weeks ago, they found 
Donald Trump guilty of raping E. Jean Carroll. The judge pointed out because of New York's penal code, the jury couldn't hand down a decision where they officially accused him of rape. But they did conclude he raped her. OK, so if you remember, I think it was in May. It's hard to keep track. If you remember right after he was found liable in that defamation suit for raping E. Jean Carroll, right after that, he went on that CNN town hall. And if you remember, he got some applause lines and big laughs. He called her a whack job. He said he never met her. He defamed her once again. And guess what? It holds up in a court of law. What Donald Trump says at a CNN town hall about E. Jean Carroll or what Donald Trump is going to say during a debate while Gr Chris Christie is grilling him about January 6th. All of that is going to hold up as evidence in the trials against Donald Trump. What Trump said on CNN or during the next debate is evidence. Chris Christie knows that. And Chris Christie knows that Donald Trump can't help himself. He has no impulse control. He's going to play to the crowd. Christie is going to purposely rattle Trump and Trump will play to the crowd. He will say something that gets his imbeciles to cheer. And the very thing that gets Donald Trump's imbeciles to cheer will be the very same thing that contributes to locking him up. Watch Chris Christie. Pay attention to Chris Christie. Bad guy. Chris Christie, bad guy. But watch him. Watch him prosecute Donald Trump when they share the debate stage, either this month or the month after. Again, Trump will win the debate with Chris Christie, but he will provide more evidence by winning that, it'll be a Pyrrhic victory. He'll win the debate, but it'll provide more evidence that gets him locked up for life. <clears throat> this is the mop up for August 2nd. I'm David Feldman. The United States Justice Department has charged 1,100 people for the role they played on January 6th. Well, on Tuesday, seven more people were added to that list, including the aforementioned Donald Trump, as well as six, six co-conspirators. Five of those co-conspirators are lawyers. Special counsel Jack Smith's Washington, D.C. grand jury looking into Donald Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. That grand jury handed down a four count indictment Tuesday night charging Donald Trump with attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election, as well as inciting the violence that took place on January 6th. I don't believe he's being charged with insurrection or seditious conspiracy. Also named in this indictment, <clears throat> the indictments in the four indictments are six co-conspirators and, as I've been saying, all but one of the co-conspirators are lawyers. I said for the past couple of weeks that this would be a prosecution of Donald Trump as well as the legal profession. Again, all but one of Donald Trump's co-conspirators are lawyers. Now, they're not being named, but if you read through the indictment, you can do the detective work. And it sure seems like one of the attorneys named as a co-conspirator is this guy. We've been talking about him all month. His name is Jeffrey Clark. It has to be Jeffrey Clark. And I've been after I read the indictment, I started skimming the newspapers and they're all they all agree. This has to be Jeffrey Clark, who uh, must be the person in the indictment identified as co-conspirator number four. He's identified as, quote, a Justice Department official who worked on civil matters and who, with a defendant, and the defendant being Donald J. Trump, who, with the defendant, attempted to use the Justice Department to open up sham election crime investigations 
and influence state legislatures with knowingly false claims of election fraud, unquote. Now, if you remember, Jeffrey Clark was a low-level Justice Department official who Donald Trump, in the waning days of his presidency, tried to name as acting attorney general so that he could turn the Justice Department into a phony voter fraud clearinghouse. So it must be Jeffrey Clark, who's co-conspirator number four. You can take that to the bank. It should also be noted that the January 6th committee in their final report zeroed in on Trump's lawyers, either recommending indictments or investigations. The January 6th committee zeroed in on Trump's lawyers recommending that the special counsel investigate Rudy Giuliani, lawyer, uh, damn it, John Eastman. That would be John Eastman uh, standing next to Rudy Giuliani on the ellipse, warming Trump's January 6th crowd up before the big insurrection. Both Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman spoke on January 6th. Uh, The January 6th committee also recommended that the special counsel investigate John Cheesebro, lawyer, as a co-conspirator. Again, these were not government lawyers. These were all lawyers who Donald Trump brought into the Oval Office after every lawyer in the Justice Department, except this guy, Jeffrey Clark, told him there was no election fraud. I cannot stress this enough. Every single lawyer working on Donald Trump's presidential campaign, lawyers like Alex Cannon, Matt Morgan, and Justin Clark, lawyers, they investigated voter fraud. They couldn't find any. They told that to Donald Trump. He met them with derision. And so they quit in the weeks leading up to January 6th. Everybody quit, right? Bill Barr, the attorney general, looked into voter fraud after the election, couldn't find any. Donald Trump pounded the table and accused Bill Barr of uh, being disloyal and told him to quit. And nobody, nobody in the Justice Department, except this guy, Jeffrey Clark, nobody, nobody said there was evidence of voter fraud. Nobody, nobody from Homeland Security, nobody in the Trump campaign, all the lawyers, all the uh, Bill Sepian, all the campaign managers, they all quit. They said there's no voter fraud. I cannot stress this enough. Trump brought in his own attorneys from outside his campaign, from outside the government, except for Jeffrey Clark, right? Low level Justice Department. Uh, department also, uh, uh, except for Jeffrey Clark, uh, nobody in the government, nobody in Trump's campaign said they could find evidence of voter fraud. No attorneys working on his presidential campaign, no attorney generals from Bill Barr to Jeff Rosen, who replaced Barr, no government lawyer, no Republican lawyer on staff saw any evidence of voter fraud, and they told Donald Trump there was no voter fraud. The only in-house lawyer willing to find voter fraud was Jeffrey Clark inside the Justice Department and possibly Jeffrey Clark's deputy at the Department of Justice, Ken Klukowski, who is said to have helped draft some of the memos that Jeffrey Clark allegedly sent attempting to convince election officials in battleground states where Biden had won, that election fraud had taken place, and that Trump won. Klukowski, back on January 6th of this year, reportedly became a cooperating witness with the special counsel, Jack Smith. That's why we don't believe he's one of the co-conspirators. It named in the indictment. It's why we believe it's Jeffrey Clark. So in the entire Justice Department, it was this guy, Ken Klukowski, who's turned state's evidence, 
and Jeffrey Clark. Co-conspirator number three is probably Sidney Powell, who Donald Trump was planning to name as special counsel inside the Justice Department in the waning days of his administration so she could prosecute phony voter fraud claims. The plan, once again, because it's hard to keep track, the plan was to make Jeffrey Clark acting attorney general and then name Sidney Powell as a special counsel who would dig up phony voter fraud cases to convince state legislatures in battleground states where Joe Biden won that the election had been stolen. So it has to be Sidney Powell. And I've been looking at The Washington Post and they're saying it's Sidney Powell in Tuesday's indictment because Jack Smith described he describes co-conspirator number three as, quote, an attorney whose unfounded claims of election fraud, the defendant, that would be Donald Trump, the defendant privately acknowledged to others sounded crazy. Nonetheless, the defendant, that would be Donald Trump, embraced and publicly amplified co-conspirator three's disinformation, unquote. So you got to be absolutely certain that it's Sidney Powell, especially because I remember reading that Trump's communication director, his communications director, Hope Hicks, reportedly told investigators that during an Oval Office phone call between Sidney Powell and Donald Trump, Sidney Powell was on the speakerphone. Trump muted her and turned to Hope Hicks and said that Sidney Powell sounded crazy in the indictment. Jack Smith writes that Donald Trump privately acknowledged others sounded crazy, that this person sounded crazy. Well, that's got to be Sidney Powell. Uh, so I have to believe that Sidney Powell is one of the co-conspirators. And co-conspirator one, it, it has to be Rudy Giuliani. Uh, here is how co-conspirator one was described in the indictment. Quote, co-conspirator one, an attorney who was willing to spread knowingly false claims and pursue strategies that the defendant's 2020 re-election campaign attorneys would not, right? He brought in outside counsel. He couldn't find an in-house attorney to spread these lies. Because, I mean, well, let me continue. Uh, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Co-conspirator number two must be John Eastman. He's the former law clerk to Clarence Thomas, good friends with Ginny Thomas. Uh, John Eastman warmed up the crowd alongside Giuliani on January 6th before Trump incited the insurrection. Eastman, close friend of Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, who was there, helped raise money for the big rally, the big Stop the Steal rally on January 6th. And John Eastman wrote a series of memos outlining how to take advantage of the loopholes in the Electoral Count Act of 1887. He explained how Trump could exploit the ambiguities in that law into pressuring Mike Pence to refrain from certifying the presidential election on January 6th. OK, here is how co-conspirator number two you got to believe it's John Eastman, and I'm not the only one who thinks it's John Eastman. Here is how co-conspirator number two is described in the indictment. Quote, co-conspirator number two, an attorney who devised and attempted to implement a strategy to leverage the vice president's ceremonial role overseeing the certification proceeding to obstruct the certification of the presidential election, unquote. It's John Eastman, who is currently undergoing a vicious disbarment trial in California. What does it take for these guys to lose their law license? What does it take? 
co-conspirator number five, I think this is a Harvard, a Harvard graduate, Harvard Law, I'm pretty sure. Co-conspirator number five most probably is Kenneth Cheesebro, who has flown under the radar. But you'll be hearing a lot about Kenneth Cheesebro. It was Kenneth Cheesebro who wrote a series of memos explaining how to implement the phony elector scheme, outlining how the phony electors should convene in their individual states, what document, what documents they needed to prepare, and how to make them look legitimate. He allegedly provided the legal undergirding to defrauding the U.S. government by teaching these phony electors in his memos, by teaching them how to present themselves to Congress as legitimate electors on January 6th. His memos also attempted to provide a legal backbone to assist Trump in pressuring Mike Pence not to certify the election on January 6th. We talked about John Cheesebro last week. Go back and watch my shows. In his memos, he, he planted an idea in Donald Trump that if you stir up, if you whip up enough activity on the street, the Supreme Court, he said, would intervene before January 6th and you would have a better chance of having the election called in your favor because the Supreme Court is packed with Republicans. And if it doesn't get thrown to the Supreme Court, it'll be thrown to Congress. And because of the way votes are weighted when a presidential election has to be decided, the Republicans had an advantage if, if Congress had a vote on who should be president, Republicans had an advantage, and John Cheesebro points all that out in, in the memos. Pretty, pretty, pretty horrible stuff, I should say, if it's true. Uh, and if he is, in fact, co-conspirator number five. But here is how co-conspirator number five is described in the indictment. Quote, co-conspirator number five, an attorney who assisted in devising and attempting to implement a plan to submit fraudulent slates of presidential electors to obstruct the certification proceeding. I have to assume that it's Harvard Law's very own Kenneth Cheesebro, and apparently other news organizations are guessing the same. And then there's co-conspirator number six, not an attorney. He's just described as a political consultant, and nobody knows who it is. So I'm going to bet that it's either Roger Stone, who has already been pardoned by Donald Trump, after he was convicted of witness tampering, or most likely Steve Bannon, who's already been pardoned by Trump uh, after he was about to go on trial for running a phony charity. Uh, Steve Bannon was convicted of contempt of Congress after refusing to testify before the January 6th committee. He's appealing that conviction. He's looking at prison time. Uh, I believe the appeals process for that conviction begins in the fall. I also believe the New York State Attorney General Letitia James and Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg back in September teamed up, back in September of last year, they teamed up to indict Steve Bannon on the state level for the uh, crime he got pardoned for by Donald Trump on the federal level, okay? Donald Trump issued a federal pardon. And so because the crime allegedly took place in New York State, in New York City, New York State Attorney General Letitia James and Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg teamed up to indict Bannon for fundraising fraud and money laundering. They're accusing Bannon of stealing $15 million from a Florida-based nonprofit called We Build the Wall. He was raising money to build that wall along the Mexican border, which I thought the Mexicans were going to pay for. That's what Trump promised. But apparently 
it was uh, going to be paid for by contributions. A lot, apparently, a lot of veterans were ripped off in this scheme, and Trump pardoned him from federal prosecution, same crime. So now he's being tried in the state of New York, where Trump's pardon doesn't hold water. So I'm going to guess, and from what I've been reading, nobody knows who the sixth co-conspirator is, but it's either Roger Stone or Steve Bannon. Stone is a clown. The bigger fish is Steve Bannon. So I'm going to go with Steve Bannon. Who do you who do you think? Who do you think it could be? It's a political operative. Who else? Who else could it be? Michael Flynn is not a political operative. Who else? Who was at the Willard Hotel in the, those meetings? It's got to be Roger Stone or Steve Bannon. Or Don Jr. Hmm. Noticeably absent from the indictment is the odious Mark Meadows, the odious Mark Meadows, one of the founders of the Freedom Caucus, who became Donald Trump's last chief of staff. And I don't believe Mark Meadows ended up in this indictment as a co-conspirator, which suggests and this is huge. It suggests Mark Meadows has flipped. And if he's flipped, Donald Trump is going away. He's going away. Let the MAGA crowd, let the bikers for Trump take to the streets. Doesn't matter. The law is the law. And Donald Trump is going away. If Mark Meadows flipped, Donald Trump is going away. Bye bye. Thank you. As I said last week, if Mark Meadows isn't indicted, and I don't think he has been, it means he struck some immunity deal. And if Meadows is cooperating with the special counsel, Jack Smith, bet the farm that Trump is done because Mark Meadows, as chief of staff, saw everything in the lead up to January 6th and on January 6th. Like I said last week on the show, Mark Meadows knows where the bodies are buried because he helped bury them. I'm going to guess that whatever crimes Donald Trump is guilty of, Mark Meadows aided and abetted practically all of them, if not co committed them. There is no greater witness for the prosecution no greater witness than Mark Meadows. He witnessed the crimes while he was committing them. There's no greater witness than somebody who was committing crimes with Donald Trump and flips. You get Meadows on the stand. No jury is going to find Donald Trump innocent. It's impossible. It's impossible. Now, interestingly enough, Donald Trump can run for president from prison. <laughs> Eugene Debs did it, right? Two great American heroes, <laughs> Eugene Debs and Donald Trump, will go down in history as running for president from prison. Uh, now, as for serving as president from prison, when he's convicted and he will be convicted. You know, I always say I'm usually wrong because I usually am, but not always. He's going to prison. He's going you know, Biden. It may get so ugly and sad. That Biden will pardon him and it, it will just feel, you know, I there is the possibility that he'll be so broken that all of us are going to say, you know, yeah, he was bad, but he's not Ron DeSantis. And he gave us a lot of laughs and he was fun. And yeah, he unleashed a lot of racism and misogyny and homophobia. And a lot of people 
got beaten up and killed, and there were a lot of shootings at synagogues and because he unleashed America's dark side. Yeah, but he was fun, unlike Ron DeSantis, who is a genuine fascist. I mean, Ron DeSantis, look at what he's doing in Florida, how he controls the mechanisms of power. He, Ron DeSantis is... He's the real deal when it comes to fascist. Donald Trump is a likable fascist. Uh, and I just have a feeling that things are going to get so bad that people like me who are obsessed with Donald Trump hate him to the core of my very being. I've hated him since I lived in New York back in the 80s. When it comes time to send him away, I think, yeah, send him away. Send him away. Uh, by the way, so he can he can run for office from a prison cell. As for serving as president from prison, uh, nobody nobody's quite sure. Um, nobody's quite sure. Um, here's the thing about that: uh, Trump and Biden right now are running neck and neck. The polls don't mean anything, but they're fun to watch. Uh, they're running neck and neck. And these elections tend to tighten up as we get closer to the general. And there are a lot of irresponsible Americans who see all of this as harmless spectacle unfolding on their TV screen. To them, it's just bread and circuses. That's why a lot of people voted for Trump. But, you know, back in 2016, I know a lot of people who said, well, that'll be interesting. Donald Trump is president. What do I care? That'll be interesting. This is, you know, people who don't care about the country, who just want to witness something they've never seen before. They go, yeah, Donald Trump. And for those same people, how do you top January 6th? Well, by getting a president whose inauguration <laughs> takes place inside San Quentin. Uh, I love this. I really do love this country. It's a shithole, but I love it. It would be really bad to see Donald Trump inaugurated inside San Quentin. But there's something I've never seen before, right? There are a lot of people who are going to vote for Trump if he thinks uh, he's going to move the Oval Office into San Quentin. Right. Everybody, including me, is thinking, well, that's something I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I wouldn't mind watching that. Right. Uh, and I think Trump could beat Biden in the general if he promises not to pardon himself. And he vows to govern from prison. You people want a show? I'll give you a show. But the fly in the ointment is the only reason Trump is running right now is to stay out of prison. He has to get elected president uh, so he can pardon himself and fire the entire Justice Department. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has been ordered to appear in court at 4 p.m., on Thursday of this week for yet another arrest. This will be his third arrest this year. It will be his third arraignment and his second set of indictments handed down by special counsel Jack Smith, who's only been on the job for eight months. And he's not messing around, Jack Smith. This is different from the Mueller investigation, right? We we all had our hopes up during the Mueller investigation. Mueller was perceived as the no nonsense no nonsense special counsel, but he never indicted because he obeyed a memo inside the Justice Department stating it is official policy not to indict a sitting president. For the record, in defense of Mueller, the second part of the Mueller report outlined a prosecution for covering up Russiagate. 
if you read the second part of the Mueller report, it's all there. You could prosecute Trump for, you know, like firing Comey for covering up the investigation. But Bill Barr, the servile Bill Barr, rewrote the uh, the presses of the Mueller report and made it look like Donald Trump had been cleared by Mueller. And Robert Mueller didn't clear Donald Trump. Bill Barr made it look like he cleared him. And that's why Mueller and Bill Barr no longer talk. So this isn't the Mueller report. There's nobody there to protect Donald Trump in the Justice Department. He's not a sitting president. Jack Smith is indicting Donald Trump. He's right. And this, as I said, is his third arrest. And it's the big enchilada. This is the big crime. The the uh, trial in Miami, uh, the uh, mishandling of classified documents, that's a slam dunk. But that's like getting Al Capone on taxes. These indictments that came down on Tuesday, this is the big enchilada. This is the big indictment. Either way, Trump is going to prison. They're either going to get him for mishandling classified documents because that's a slam dunk. This is an even bigger slam dunk, but... Uh, you know, it's too big. You know, we're looking into the abyss. It, 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 sometimes when a crime is so big, we in America go, hey, you know what? Uh, let it go. Uh, let, let him be president again. This crime is way too big. Uh, January 6th. This time around, they're getting him for January 6th. And here's the thing that I cannot stress enough. Trump has nobody. He has nobody. He's got his idiot supporters. But when it comes to this trial, he's got nobody. Nobody will testify on his behalf. Nobody. They all got paraded before the grand jury. They all told the truth. He's got nobody. Nobody will speak up for him. Well, there are some people who would speak up for him. Unfortunately, they've all been indicted as co-conspirators. See, his lawyers are all going down and he's going down. Maybe this is for personal reasons, but this is going to be the greatest trial of my lifetime, because it just doesn't mean Trump is getting locked up, but Rudy is going down. Racist Rudy. Anybody who lived in New York who remembers when racist Rudy was mayor, they used to go, it's Giuliani time. That's what the cops used to scream. It's Giuliani time. And you know what Giuliani time meant? A black person was going to end up in the hospital. That's what Giuliani time means. Giuliani, horrible racist. I can't wait to see him go down. As well as the four other lawyers, because there is nothing sweeter in life than watching attorneys, several of whom are graduates of Harvard Law. There's nothing sweeter than watching them finally get disbarred, you know, after they're convicted. I think they're all going to get disbarred. That never happens, but it will be delicious watching these lawyers crumble and end up in prison for trying to destroy my country. This trial is not just about the corruption in our system. It's about the corruption in our legal system. It's about America's epidemic of lawyers who will say and do anything for money, prestige, or just to feel relevant. Lawyers, 90% of American lawyers are scumbags. And those are the ones I trust. 
So let's get out the Jurgens and the box of Kleenex, shall we? And review the three indictments. I'll go full screen because I don't want you to see what I'm doing while, <laughs> while I read off the indictments. Is it three indictments? Four indictments, right? United States versus Donald Trump. Ah, four count indictment. This is Tuesday's indictment. Number one, count one, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Right? That would be the phony elector scheme. Okay? Count number two, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. That would be riling up the crowd on January 6th and taking our Congress hostage before they could certify the election for Joe Biden. Most of the 1,100 January 6ers are being charged with something like count number two. I believe. I believe. Count number three, uh, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. That would also be... Uh, that, I think that also includes obstruction of justice. And maybe, I'm not sure. I, I read the indictment, but I, you know, it, it was, uh, I think, witness tamper. I think maybe witness tampering falls under count three. I'm not sure. And then count number four, conspiracy against rights, which is a really interesting uh, reconstruction era law that has been used to protect uh, freed slaves uh, and it involves voting rights, that when you conspire to overturn an election, you're violating the constitutional rights of Americans' right to vote. So that's conspiracy against rights. And that has been used... Uh, countlessly throughout the 20th century to prosecute the KKK as well as uh, protect the voting rights of African-Americans. Uh, when you try to overturn an election, you're depriving, um, you're, you're disenfranchising Americans. Th that is, count for is the surprising charge. Uh, so those are the charges in the indictments, uh, prosecutors charge that then president, I'm just going to review this because it's hard to keep track of all this. And it is the biggest story of the year. It is. It should be climate change. It should be Medicare for all. It should be income inequality. Uh, this is unfortunately, this is the big story. And maybe uh, quashing the fascism in uh, the Republican Party, man, nah, nah. the problem <laughs> the problem is the Democrats. That's why we don't have Medicare for all. That's why we're not solving climate change. Or uh, you could lock up the entire Republican Party unless you purge the Democrats of millionaire elitists, we ain't doing anything about Medicare for all or tackling climate change. So so this is unfortunately the story of the year. In the indictments, the prosecutors charged that then President Donald Trump, and this is interesting because I saw Rudy on one of those Fox News uh, knockoffs. I think not Newsmax. There's another one. And he was very upset Tuesday night. Uh, he, he didn't acknowledge that he's one of the co-conspirators, but he, he was almost crying and he was act still pretending that he was Donald Trump's attorney. It was uh, sad, but mostly funny. Uh, screw him. He was pretending he was speaking out uh, for Donald Trump, accusing uh, Jack Smith of violating Donald Trump's First Amendment rights. This is what Rudy was saying on own or it's not Newsmax. He's saying that that this is all about censorship and freedom of speech. That's the go to 
for these Republicans. Everything's protected by freedom of speech. Unless you want to teach uh, that slavery was horrible or if you want to teach uh, human sexuality, then freedom of speech, not so important. So this is what uh, uh, Jack Smith and his attorneys write at the top of the indictment. And this is really important. Uh, they said that Donald Trump had the right not just to contest the 2020 presidential election, but like any American, he even had a First Amendment right to lie about it. Read the indictment. It's a beautiful paragraph. They say, like any American, Donald Trump had a First Amendment right to spread lies about the results. And this is what Rudy's claiming, right? This is, a, you know, you're prosecuting him uh, because of, of what he said, right? Well, you know, if you say to somebody, I want you to go kill uh, my sister, right? That's not, and you, that's not protected by the First Amendment. But that's what Rudy is maintaining uh, Tuesday night, that this is all about freedom of speech, right? Um, so let me... Let me just go back to what they write in the indictment, because it's really beautiful. Uh, Donald Trump had a had a First Amendment right to spread lies about the presidential election. Jack Smith is saying we all have a constitutional right to lie. But he says in the indictment that Trump's lies veered into fraud when Trump actively conspired to prevent legitimate votes from getting counted. Trump's freedom of speech doesn't include conspiring, yammering with others to, quote, subvert election results. That's what Jack Smith is charging Donald Trump of subverting election results, not protected by freedom of speech. The indictment charges that Trump broke three specific laws, I believe four specific laws, actually. One, Trump tried to block the collecting, the counting and certification of votes through what is described as deceit, fraud and dishonesty. Wow, Donald Trump, deceit, fraud and dishonesty. That's never heard him described that way. Another law he broke was attempting to prevent the United States government on January 6 from performing its constitutional duty to uh, certify the presidential election. And he also conspired to deprive Americans of their constitutional right to have their votes counted. That's the uh, the uh, the civil rights law that was passed during Reconstruction. Now, it was a busy Tuesday before the indictments were handed down. Trump took to social media. He knew this was coming. He warned his followers that he expected to be indicted by special counsel Jack Smith. Trump said earlier on Tuesday he expected indictments to be handed down by 5 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. By 5.15 Eastern, there were already reports that the indictments had been handed down. He doesn't lie. Trump is an inveterate liar, but he seemed when he, when he says he's about to get indicted, he's telling the truth. It's the only time he ever tells the truth. No former president, nobody, no former president has ever been criminally indicted. And like I've been saying, this marks the third set of criminal indictments for Donald Trump this year, there are two sets of indictments from special counsel Jack Smith, right? You have the first set of indictments over Trump's mishandling of classified material. And then you have Tuesday's new set of indictments, the big enchilada, the indictments over Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. And let's not forget the third criminal indictment from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, over violating campaign finance laws in the paying of hush money to porn stars Stormy Daniels. Those are the criminal 
indictments. There are all these other civil trials that Trump has got going on. E. Jean Carroll is suing him again for defamation. And Letitia James, the New York State Attorney General, is uh, suing the Trump organization for fraud, uh, for tax fraud and misleading banks in taking out loans. The pursuit of Donald Trump is simultaneously a top-down and a bottom-up enterprise. From the top, you have special counsel Jack Smith. But from the bottom, from the bottom, you have more indictments on the way, bubbling up from all those battleground states that Donald Trump is accused in Tuesday's indictment, where he's been accused of trying to overturn elections. So you got the federal government prosecuting him now for what he did in the battleground states. And then you have attorneys in the battleground states locally prosecuting the low hanging fruit to get their way to Trump. Or you have, most notably, the uh, district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia, Fannie Willis, who's not working her way up the food chain. She appears to be going straight for Trump. Over the weekend, she pretty much said that her two year investigation, where she convened two separate grand juries, looking into Donald Trump's election interference. Remember Georgia? Remember he called the Secretary of State of Georgia, Raffsenberger, and said, find me one extra vote and kind of threatened him. She indicated she is prepared to indict Donald Trump for his attempts to overturn the election results in Georgia. And nobody is coming to his defense. Republican Governor Brian Kemp once is cooperating with special counsel Jack Smith on this. He's looking into Georgia as well. And nobody in Georgia, not the secretary of state, nobody is going to come to his defense down there. He's alone. Barricades have already been erected outside the courthouse in Fulton County, where Trump is expected to be arraigned, although it might not be in Fulton County. I, I'm not sure if the arraignment takes place in Fulton County. Now, Fannie Willis is African-American and Donald Trump has accused her of being racist the same way he accused African-American Manhattan D.A. Alvin Bragg, who indicted Donald Trump. He's been accused of being racist and he's also accused Letitia James, the African-American attorney general of the state of New York. He's accused her of being racist. And that's why the African-American district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, needs extra protection because she's getting racist death threats. Part of the authoritarian playbook always happens with Donald Trump. Always death threats. Always well, he's got a problem in Michigan because that state attorney, General Dana Nessel, is white. So he can't accuse her of being racist. And she's prosecuting 16 Republicans who took part in Donald Trump's phony elector scheme. Michigan has 16 electors that they sent to the uh, Electoral College, right? Well, the Trump administration arranged for 16 phony electors, and all of those phony electors have been indicted by Michigan State Attorney General Dana Nessel. That happened last week. And some of those charged, some of those 16 phony electors are already flipping. They're claiming they were misled and they were told to sign documents to commit forgery. They claim they had no idea what they were signing. They say that their signatures were then transposed onto other documents that they knew nothing about. So that trial 
is going to bubble up to Donald Trump because the phony, the 16 phony Republican electors in Michigan didn't dream that up by themselves. This was a national conspiracy. So that trial in Michigan will eventually bubble up to Donald Trump as well as to jo- <sighs> That would have been nice if I got that. John Eastman. It will bubble up to John Eastman, who's a lawyer who drafted the memos for the phony elector scheme. It'll bubble up to Kenneth Cheesebro, Harvard lawyer, who allegedly wrote some of the memos outlining how these phony electors could forge documents. Right. It'll bubble up to Rudy Giuliani. It'll bubble up to, he's a lawyer, Sidney Powell, lawyer. And it'll bubble up. See, it bubbles up from the states. It'll bubble up to Jeffrey Clark, the low-level Justice Department lawyer, who all these lawyers, including Jeffrey Clark, they either wrote memos outlining the phony elector scheme Or some of them traveled to the battleground states where the phony elector schemes took place to help orchestrate this attempt to defraud the United States government, as well as violate the constitutional rights of American voters by trying to make sure their votes didn't get counted. Right. This is disenfranchisement, which Republicans are great at doing. And it's not just the phony elector scheme being prosecuted on the state level. Okay, you got the phony elector scheme being prosecuted in all these battleground states. The Arizona attorney general is starting to prosecute it. It's already started in Michigan. Fannie Willis in Georgia. Any day now is going to start prosecuting that. You also got Rudy traveling to all these battleground states testifying before uh, the legislative branch, trying to convince them there was voter fraud, lying about voter fraud, hoping that the legislative branch would call the results in these battleground states fraud and then send phony electors to Washington, D.C. on January 6th. It's not just the phony electors scheme. On Tuesday, The state attorney general of Michigan, right? Uh, Where is she? Dana Nessel. Did I lose her? Well, anyway, she indicted this guy, Matthew DiPerno. He ran for Dana Nessel's job last year, and he lost, even though he received an endorsement from Donald Trump. Matthew DiPerno, Republican, was indicted on Tuesday for tampering with voting machines after the 2020 presidential election, right? He ran for Michigan State Attorney General in 2022. Trump endorsed him because in 2020, he led the voter fraud contingent in Michigan. Trump lost Michigan and Matthew DiPerno was a loyal foot soldier, and he is charged with illegally obtaining voting machines after the 2020 elections and opening them up to retrieve data that would prove fraud. Okay. Uh, What I really appreciate about this indictment is that Dana Nessel is a Democrat and she's playing hardball. She's the state attorney general of Michigan and she's trying to lock up the guy who ran against her in 2022 for attorney general, right? This is something Republicans would do. They don't think Democrats are going to play the kind of hardball that Republicans are willing to play. And that's how fascists assume power because they because they assume that people like Dana Nessel aren't going to play hardball. What you have here is the state attorney general of Michigan Democrat who won trying to lock up her opponent back in 20, the guy she defeated in 2022. Now she's trying to lock him up. 
this is stuff the Republicans try to do, but uh, she's right for doing it. They just assume these lawyers get away with this crap because they assume the Democrats are too genteel. You know, it, it's, it would be unseemly for the state attorney general of Michigan, a Democrat, to try to lock up her opponent, right? No, it's not unseemly. That's how you lose democracies, by not prosecuting crypto fascists. Well, back to Trump and the four indictments. Uh, I got to wrap it up. Uh, prosecutors, just to review, prosecutors are charging Trump and his six co-defendants with spreading lies to deceive election officials in battleground states to disenfranchise millions of voters by convincing election officials not to count their votes. That's not protected by the First Amendment. You're going to be hearing that, that what, just telling state officials not to count people's votes? That, that's not protected by the First Amendment? No. You know what else isn't protected by the First Amendment? Telling somebody to kill your sister. That's not protected by the First Amendment. The indictment says Trump conspired to create phony sets of electors to send to Congress in order to create the illusion that members of Congress could choose between two slates of electors in the states Trump falsely claimed to have won. Trump and his co-conspirators are charged with organizing phony elector schemes in the following states. And pay attention to these states and their attorney generals. Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico. There was a call to New Mexico that is just as bad, if not worse, than the call that Trump made to Georgia. Pay attention to New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, where local Republicans were encouraged to forge documents and commit fraud against the United States government, all under the watchful eye of Donald Trump and his co-conspirators, five of whom are lawyers. Trump and his co-conspirators are charged with trying to hijack. This is really important because this is Jeffrey Clark. This is the Jeffrey Clark, Sidney Powell story. Trump and his co-conspirators are charged with trying to hijack the United States Justice Department, forcing, tricking United States attorneys into prosecuting phony election fraud cases in order to build a phony case that Joe Biden didn't win. Right. Jeffrey Clark. I'm going to repeat this because it's hard to keep Jeffrey Clark, low level Justice Department official, Donald Trump wanted to name him acting attorney general to find non-existent voter fraud. Sidney Powell was going to be the special counsel that uh, Jeffrey Clark would appoint. And she would literally turn the Justice Department into a voter fraud creation machine. And uh, Trump and his uh, co-conspirators are charged with strong arming Vice President Pence into not certifying the presidential election on January 6. They are all charged with using phony legal arguments to coerce Mike Pence into violating the Electoral Count Act of 1887. The indictment goes on to say, and this is about the violence. I saved the violence for last. OK, now, I read the indictment. I don't see any charges of seditious conspiracy. Uh, I don't see any insurrection charges. I'm going to double check. By the way, there are such things as superseding indictments. We saw that last week with the uh, classified material indictment, right? Last week, Jack Smith added three new indictments and uh, new one new co-conspirator. So we, we don't know if Donald Trump will end up getting 
indicted for insurrection or seditious conspiracy. It may not be this tranche of indictments, but there are probably more indictments coming down. And never forget that we have leaders of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers doing time right now. Stuart Rhodes, head of the Oath Keepers, Yale Law School, doing time for seditious conspiracy. And Enrico Terrio, head of the Proud Boys, as well as an FBI informer, but we won't talk about that, as well as an informer uh, for the Washington police, their intelligence department, Rico Terrio, head of the Proud Boys. He's doing time for seditious conspiracy, and their names were mentioned, both their names were mentioned in the Oval Office in the lead up to January 6th. And as I've pointed, I don't have time to go into the legal fees. I'll do that tomorrow. But I've pointed out uh, last week that uh, Donald Trump is paying uh, the legal fees, not just, you know, out of his super PAC. I think his super PAC has spent $40 million this year on legal fees. He's paying for the legal fees of people at the top of the conspiracy and then for some reason, Stuart Rhodes, who runs the Oath Keepers, his co-conspirator, Meg, I don't know, I can't remember his name. For some reason, one of Trump's lawyers was defending an Oath Keeper who got sentenced to, uh, what, 18 years for seditious conspiracy. Why is Trump paying the legal fees? Why is the lawyer who's handling all of Trump's closest advisors. Why is he also handling an oath keeper who's doing time for seditious conspiracy? Well, the violence that happened on January 6th, I'm saving that for last. Uh, the indictment goes on to say, quote, after it became public on the afternoon of January 6th, that the vice president would not fraudulently, fraudulently alter the election results. A large and angry crowd, including many individuals whom the defendant, that would be Donald Trump, had deceived into believing the vice president could and might change the election results, violently attacked the Capitol and halted the proceeding. <clears throat> As violence ensued, and this is, you, this is the pathology. The, 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 these are sociopaths. Like Rudy Giuliani is a, besides being an alcoholic, is also a sociopath. As violence ensued, the defendant and co-conspirators exploited the disruption of January 6th by redoubling efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification based on on those claims, unquote. It's a rambling sentence. Even after January 6th, Rudy Giuliani was on the phone calling senators, calling Congress people, urging them, when, when you finally clean up the place later tonight, don't certify the election for Joe Biden. That's a sociopath. I mean, even Lindsey Graham said, count me out after January 6th uh, to, to be working the phones. The indictment establishes Trump's criminal intent. We talked about this last week. The indictment establishes Trump's criminal intent by presenting a laundry list of high level government officials who disabused Trump of any notion that voter fraud was real, okay? If Trump, Trump could get away with these lies and urging uh, people to uh, challenge the election if he actually believed the election was stolen. There is not a single person other than Jeffrey Clark Nobody in the Justice Department, nobody in Homeland Security, nobody in his campaign, Ivanka, nobody said there was evidence of voter fraud. Nobody. 
except the outside lawyers he brought in to lie about voter fraud and Jeffrey Clark, who from the indictment appears to have been willing to lie about voter fraud so he could be acting attorney general for a couple of days. Despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, Trump knowingly misled the American people, state election officials by claiming voter fraud, even though he knew none existed. And that is criminal. It's criminal intent. If there is not a single person who can say they told Donald Trump they had proof of voter fraud, but he continued to lie, that's criminal intent. Uh, he had to look outside the government, except for Jeffrey Clark. He had to look outside the Republican Party to find lawyers willing to help him spread lies. That's criminal intent. I'm looking for lawyers who will help me lie. Criminal intent. Jack Smith is going to parade before this jury one government official, one White House official, one Republican Party official after another. He's going to parade before this jury one lawyer after another who will all testify that they told Trump that voter fraud doesn't exist. The only lawyers who told him there was voter fraud are listed as co-conspirators in this indictment. That proves Donald Trump's mens rea, his state of mind. He knew he lost. He lied anyway to try to steal the election. And even with all this, I hate Ron DeSantis more. I, if, I, if I had a pick between DeSantis being president or Donald Trump, I'd still pick Donald Trump over Ron DeSantis. The indictment also charges Trump with exploiting the violence on January 6 to delay the certification of the election. The indictment implies that the purpose of that riot, of that insurrection, was to delay a government proceeding. That Trump knew what he was saying, what he was convincing the crowd to do in order to delay a government proceeding against the law. Uh, the indictment charges that while every single member of Congress, including Kevin McCarthy, who, as Congressman Slawell called to said to his face, you're a pussy. Uh, while they were all cowering, hiding from the barbarians, Trump sat back, watched television, watched it all happen. And when things settled down, he still lobbied them to certify. It's incredible. It's incredible. And they have him dead to rights. I got to wrap it up. Sorry, I went too long. Shit. So what does this all mean for the presidential elections? Well, all these indictments and convictions become moot. If Trump gets elected president, right? Can he pardon himself? Who knows? But if he's president, you can be sure he can. And new polling from the New York Times, big polling out on Tuesday shows that of the people who plan on voting for Trump, 17 percent say he has committed a crime or he does serve as a threat to democracy but I'm voting for him anyway. 17% of the people who are going to vote for Trump say, yeah, he's a criminal and he's a threat to democracy, but I like him. The number of Trump voters who say Trump has committed a crime has more than doubled from 6% back in September of last year to 13% as of this week. Okay? But that doesn't mean they're not going to vote for him. It means, yeah, 
more and more people are acknowledging he's a criminal, he's a threat to democracy. But that doesn't mean these people aren't going to vote for him. Why? One Trump supporter told pollsters from the New York Times that he used to be a Democrat, but the Democratic Party no longer speaks for the working middle class, that the Democratic Party is weak when it comes to the working middle class. And there are new polls out that Biden, when it comes to the question, who do you trust more on the economy? More voters trust Trump than Joe Biden. Now, you look at the macroeconomic numbers, inflation, reducing the debt, reducing the deficit, unemployment, job creation. When you look at the big numbers, Biden destroys, destroys Donald Trump, whose numbers you can't run on these numbers. I mean, he lost more jobs as president than any president since Herbert Hoover and the Great Depression. Right. He racked up seven and a half. The debt, like one third of the debt is because of his tax cut for the wealthy. The, the debt is what, 32 trillion. And he gave us what, seven and a half trillion of that. Uh, so why are the Democrats losing when it comes to the working middle class? Why does the working middle class still like Trump more than uh, Joe Biden? How do, is it possible for the Democratic Party to be losing the working middle class. This is who the Democratic Party is supposed to speak up for, the working middle class. This is who we have, right? Pro-labor, Democratic Party, Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson. How is it possible that the Republican Party, the party that caters to the richest 1% of the 1%, gives tax cuts to the wealthy, uh, ships jobs overseas, how is it possible that the people who the Republican Party destroys end up voting for them? Well, it's what I talked about on yesterday's program. Culture wars, culture war. Let me have some water here. Uh, sorry. My new uh, my New York police cup. Oh, somebody complained. They don't like to hear me sipping water. So I apologize. Uh, culture wars. This is why the Democrats lose the working middle class, because culture wars will fill the vacuum left by a Democratic Party that refuses to make life easier for the working middle class and the poor. If you don't push for Medicare for all, if you don't raise the minimum, the minimum wage has not been raised since 2009. It's $7.25. There's no minimum wage anymore. $7.25 means there's no minimum wage anymore. If you don't fight for free tuition in our public schools, if the Democrats are not going to transfer wealth from the top down to the middle class and the poor, then the Republicans are going to fill that void by ginning up rage about the transgender community, black people, immigrants, affirmative action, and who loves America more, you know, and socialism. They'll, they'll gin up rage against the very thing that would help the working middle class socialism. When there's a vacuum, when you have a Democratic Party that only pays lip service to the working poor and the middle class, the Republicans 
move in with the culture wars because somebody has to be blamed for our immiseration. Somebody is to blame for my kid uh, being saddled with credit card debt, auto loan debt, student loan debt, and unable to pay the rent. And the Republicans say it's because of migrants. Okay, I'll buy that. But what are the re- what are the Democrats giving me? What are the de- are they raising the minimum wage? What are the Democrats? Okay, I'll blame I'll blame people of color. I'll blame the migrants. When Republicans fight culture wars and the Democrats refuse to fight back by redistributing wealth, then low information workers, low information voters are going to wrongly assume that Republicans are more in tune with the working middle class than the Democrats are. So. If you want to win elections, the Democrats need to start talking about redistribution of wealth. You know, when Barack Obama was arguing with Joe the plumber, he got kind of cute and mentioned redistribution of wealth. And then I went, oh, okay," But then he, of course, because he's Obama, he walked it back. Say those words, Democrats. Redistribution of wealth. That's how you save democracy, and that's how you prevent this country from falling into the clutches of fascism. Say these words redistribution of wealth. As Harvey J.K. has brought up on the show countless times since Reagan, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth. That money from the middle class to the richest 1%, all the money from the middle class went right to the richest 1%. That redistribution of wealth, you can talk about. That's that's fine, right? That tax cut that that uh, Donald Trump gave the wealthy in 2017 that added seven trillion, seven and a half trillion to our debt, that redistribution of wealth. That's not socialism, right? It's time to reverse the flow when it comes to redistribution of wealth. And if the Democrats want to save what's left of this democracy and destroy the fascists, they need to have the testicular fortitude, the ovarian fortitude to say redistribution of wealth. That's how you win elections. That's how you have blue tsunamis by talking about taxing billionaires out of existence. That's how you win elections. Say it with me. Redistribution of wealth. We begin this morning with new reporting from Axios on the toll gun violence continues to take. On American lives. According to the Gun Violence Archive, 2023 is shaping up to be a record year with an average of two mass shootings a day. Let's break it down. That would be Wayne LaPierre, the head of the National Rifle Association on the right. And I consider him personally responsible for all these deaths. Let's break it down, shall we? The United States has seen an average of two mass shootings every day for a running total of 419 so far this year. More than 25,000 people have died from gun violence this year. I don't want to hear about suicides. Suicide is gun violence. An average of 118 deaths per day. On average, five of those deaths are under the age of 17. Let's continue. More than 22,000 people have been injured by gunshots so far in 2023. 400 children have been injured by guns this year so far. 2,400 teens injured by guns this year so far. CBS reports that gun violence in America costs more than $1 billion in medical bills each year. Gunshots, on average, cost 
each victim $10,000. It's $10,000 to treat a gunshot victim. In the past two weeks, Speaker Kevin McCarthy has waffled on whether he would agree on introducing articles of impeachment against Joe Biden because of the business dealings of the president's unelected son, Hunter Biden. I don't know if you know this, Republicans, but we don't put presidential sons to a vote. Now, if your eyes glaze over when it comes to the investigation of Hunter Biden, don't worry. You are supposed to be confused. That's the game plan for the Republicans. It's like the Benghazi hearings with Hillary. Remember those back in, what, 2016? Nobody could explain what exactly Hillary supposedly did wrong with Benghazi. But Kevin McCarthy was quoted as saying, we accomplished in knocking her poll numbers down. And when you talk to Republicans privately about this Burisma hoax, and that's what it is, there was the Benghazi hoax, and this is the Burisma hoax. When you ask Republicans secretly what this is about, it's politics. It's bringing down Joe Biden's poll numbers because there's no there, there. Nobody could explain what Hillary supposedly did wrong with Benghazi. And with Hunter Biden and the Burisma hoax, the charges against Joe Biden are not worth dignifying. Now, I didn't vote for Joe Biden in the primaries. I voted for him in the general election. I'm a Bernie guy. I'm voting for Joe Biden. I have no choice. What the Republicans are doing, because the Republicans are fascists, what the Republicans are doing with the Burisma hoax is creating a lot of smoke without any fire. Most Americans, including you and me, really can't be bothered to pay attention to the Burisma hoax. And low information voters who are on the fence, they see some smoke and they think, hmm, maybe there's fire. There's no fire here. None. Over the weekend, Donald Trump threatened Republicans during his rally in Erie, Pennsylvania. He warned Republicans, especially in Congress, if they don't start prosecuting Biden, if they don't start impeaching him, he's going to start primary challenges on any Republican members of Congress who don't get on board the impeach Joe Biden bandwagon. Trump has been trying to dig up dirt on Hunter Biden since right before his first impeachment back in 2019. If you remember, he held up delivery of weapons to Ukraine unless President Zelensky agreed to help Rudy Giuliani. Yes, Rudy Giuliani help Rudy Giuliani dig up dirt on Hunter Biden's business dealing with Burisma. That would be Burisma, a Ukrainian natural gas producer, a bigger natural gas producer than Rudy Giuliani. And they put, Burisma put Hunter Biden on its board of directors back in 2014, while Hunter's daddy was vice president under Obama. And that was a little unseemly, but not illegal. Burisma has been the subject of several criminal investigations around the world mostly for money laundering Repub and bribery. Republicans, they know there's never going to be a criminal investigation here in the United States when it comes to Hunter Biden and Burisma, because like I said, there's no there there. This is all political. The Republicans want to convince enough voters that Burisma, through Hunter Biden, transferred $5 million in bribes to Joe Biden. Biden, in return for then Vice President Joe Biden visiting Ukraine and then pressuring the country to fire this guy. This would be Viktor Shokin, who was Ukraine's prosecutor general. Now, none of this is true. It doesn't have to be true because it's never going to go to trial, right? So you can just throw dirt in the eyes of the American voter and some of them will think 
something criminal happened. Donald, if something criminal happened vis-a-vis Joe Biden and Viktor Shokin, who was fired as Ukraine's prosecutor general, if something criminal had happened, Donald Trump had four years as president to get his Justice Department on this. But there was no there there, which is why he brought in Rudy Giuliani to investigate. Not working for the government, working for Donald Trump for free. When you can't find anyone in the entire Justice Department willing to prove voter fraud in 2020, you bring in Rudy Giuliani. Can't find anyone in the Justice Department to prosecute Hunter Biden for his ties to Burisma? Bring in Rudy Giuliani. And that's exactly what Donald Trump did. He had four years as president to lock Hunter Biden up. But there was nothing there with Burisma. The attorney general, Bill Barr, he would have prosecuted. He he loved doing Donald Trump's dirty work within reason. No, they're there. This is a hoax. Burisma is a hoax. It's politics, which is why you have Republican chairman, committee chairman, investigating Hunter and never a special prosecutor. This all started with Rudy Giuliani and anything that starts with Rudy Giuliani can come to no good. It is all fake. Rudy Giuliani has been the point man on Hunter Biden. He's not working for the government. He's working for then President Donald Trump freelancing, not getting paid. Rudy was sent to Ukraine to dig up political dirt on Hunter Biden Not criminal dirt, political dirt. In fact, in the call that got him impeached when Donald Trump was speaking to Zelensky and saying, you know, I want to give you the weapons that have been authorized. But first, you got to do me a favor. We need dirt on Hunter Biden. So Rudy was off in Ukraine looking for dirt And it's not like Attorney General Bill Barr was waiting anxiously to discover what Rudy Giuliani was going to discover in Kiev, right? The entire Justice Department, Trump's entire Justice Department, knew Rudy Giuliani is a hopeless alcoholic, desperate for both attention and money. It was Rudy Giuliani who got his hands on Hunter Biden's laptop and peddled the contents of the New York Post right before the 2020 election. And he got his hands on that laptop, resulting in a series of chain of custody issues, because Rudy's a complete incompetent. There were so many chain of custody issues. Automatically, it made the laptop impossible to be entered in a court of law as evidence. But this was never ever about a criminal prosecution. This was about humiliating Hunter Biden and throwing dirt in the eyes of the voters to make them think that Joe Biden is as corrupt as Donald Trump, which is impossible. Rudy was brought in to convince just enough American voters that that there's fire inside all that smoke. There wasn't. It was just smoke. So the phony narrative, the hoax that Republicans are pushing uh, to get Trump elected and keep him out of prison, because Trump knows the only thing that's going to keep him out of prison is getting reelected. This he's forcing loyal Republicans to push this narrative on the American people. So they say, you know what? Biden's corrupt, too. I'm going to stay home on Election Day or I'm stupid. I'm going to vote for Trump. Again, this is Victor Shokin. He was the top prosecutor in Ukraine back in 2016, when then Vice President Joe Biden visited Ukraine with his son, Hunter. Probably not a good idea to have brought his son along with him. These are the facts. Biden was doing President Obama's bidding, as well as the International Monetary Fund's bidding, 
when he told then Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko to fire Shokin. Okay, Victor Shokin, the top prosecutor, Joe Biden, flies to Ukraine in 2016 and says to then Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, you got to fire your top prosecutor. And if you don't, we will withhold one billion dollars in loan guarantees. The reason Biden, Obama and the entire West wanted choke and fired is because Ukraine is an incredibly corrupt country, almost as corrupt as Russia. And America wanted to do business with Ukraine, but they didn't want to do business with an incredibly corrupt Ukraine. And they wanted a prosecutor to clean the country up. Biden, the IMF, Obama insisted that Shokin be fired because he was perceived as a puppet of the ex-president of Ukraine, who was perceived as a puppet of Putin. You know, kind of like Trump and the entire Republican Party are puppets of Putin. So Shokin was fired in order to bring in someone who would crack down on the corruption in Ukraine. But the political narrative that Rudy Giuliani peddled is that then Vice President Joe Biden ordered the firing of Shokin, the special, the, the top prosecutor in Ukraine. He ordered the firing of Shokin because Biden was trying to cover up for the crimes, for the imaginary crimes committed by Hunter. He was trying to protect Burisma the Ukrainian gas producer who put Hunter on their board of directors. He fired Shokin because he didn't want Hunter and Burisma to be prosecuted for crimes like bribery and money laundering. That's Rudy Giuliani's demented version of events. That comes from Trump's mind and Rudy's mind, and it's being forced upon loyal Republicans in the House to push this lie, the Burisma hoax, because the truth is that firing Shokin was bad for Hunter Biden. It was bad for Burisma because Shokin, Victor Shokin, the top prosecutor, wasn't prosecuting Burisma. The truth is Shokin was refusing to prosecute Burisma because it had connections to the former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, who, like I said, was a Putin puppet. Viktor Yanukovych ended up running to Russia after the Maidan revolution, taking along with them untold riches. In 2016, Joe Biden flew to Ukraine as Obama's vice president and said, we want a prosecutor to root out corruption which was not good for Burisma. But in the Republican playbook, that doesn't matter. This is about politics, not crimes, the appearance of a crime. This is about getting Donald Trump reelected so he, the real criminal, doesn't go to prison because he will control the FBI and the Justice Department. Now, Republicans know that you and I can't keep any of these names straight. They know that. The same thing with Benghazi. They knew it went in one ear and out the other. That's what that's what they bank on. This is all about creating smoke, creating a suggestion of corruption. They're not about to prosecute. This is about winning elections to paint Joe Biden as a crime boss So some voters will throw up their hands saying it's so confusing. I guess they're all corrupt. Both sides do it. No, both sides don't do it. Let me repeat, both sides don't do it. Republicans are way more corrupt than the Democrats and Republicans are fascists. Democrats are hypocrites. Democrats are hypocrites. They skirt the law, but they don't violate the law. Republicans break the law, 
plus they're fascists and they're bigots. Again, I'm not saying Democrats aren't corrupt, but not on the scale that we see with Republicans, especially Donald Trump. But if you want to be intellectually lazy, like Joe Rogan, I was watching him today with Jim Gaffigan, and it's faux intellectualism. It's, you know, when you say, or Jimmy Dore, hey, both sides do it. No, that's how charlatans present themselves as open-minded when they say both sides are corrupt. Anyone who says both sides are corrupt, it means they're Republicans. Anybody in this day and age who says both sides are corrupt, it means you're a Republican, but you don't want to admit it. So the House Judiciary Committee, controlled by Republicans, it's under the leadership of Jim Jordan, who went to law school but was too stupid, couldn't pass the bar exam, so he's never been allowed to practice law, yet he's the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Republican Jim Jordan, who is too stupid to pass the bar, even though he went to uh, law school. Uh, he's holding nonstop hearings into this so-called Biden crime family. That's what they call it now. They call it the Biden crime family. And uh, that's Jim Jordan, who heads the uh, House Judiciary Committee and House Oversight is chaired by Republican James Comer. And they are trying to create a phony paper trail uh, that proves Joe Biden is running a criminal enterprise through his crack addicted alcoholic son. And on Monday, behind closed doors, the House Oversight Committee interviewed their star witness. It was this guy, Devin Archer. And it blew up completely in the Republican Party's face, as it often does. So they have to lie and spin it. But it was a disaster. Once again, they failed to prove they couldn't prove anything with Benghazi and they can't prove anything with Burisma. So they spin and they lie banking on stupid Americans to figure something must be there with Burisma. There's nothing. They have nothing. Devin Archer, to refresh your memory, was Hunter Biden's business partner. He, too, served on the board of Burisma alongside Hunter Biden. Now, these are not noble guys. Uh, Devin Archer was a classmate of John Kerry's stepson. I believe it's Christopher Hines. Uh, they met at Yale. And so Devin Archer, uh, Christopher Hines and Joe Biden's son, Hunter, opened an investment firm, I think, in 2009. And yes, it stinks to high heaven. It stinks. But none of it is illegal. It should be, but none of it's illegal. There's no crime. Although, Devin Archer did end up going to prison for defrauding a Native American tribe in 2014 by tricking them into issuing development bonds and then keeping roughly $43 million of the proceeds for himself. Bad guy. Bad guy. Uh, ripping somebody off for $43 million makes you a bad guy. Ripping off uh, Native American tribes makes you even worse of a person. Bad guy. And uh, so is Hunter Biden. I wouldn't vote for Hunter Biden if they had elections for presidential sons. Wouldn't vote for Hunter. Bad guy. Damaged. Guns. Crack cocaine. I think he owed a million dollars in taxes. He doesn't pay child support. He is a deeply troubled, deeply, deeply troubled and flawed individual who operates on the margins. Right. But he's not a criminal, not the kind of criminal the Republicans wish he were. He's not that kind of criminal. There's nothing to see here when it comes to the Joe Biden Hunter Biden connection. No crime. It's just smoke. A father 
is not responsible for his adult son's criminal behavior. And as we're saying, yeah, Hunter uh, violated the law with uh, his taxes and uh, the crack and uh, the guns that he he lied when he filled out a permit to uh, buy a gun. Uh, the only crime that Joe Biden committed is the crime that every loving father commits, and that's you love your troubled son no matter what. And you love him so much you make mistakes trying to help him. That's there's no easy answer in dealing with a son who's an addict. There is nobody gets it right. You make mistakes. Uh, but if you've heard the messages that Joe Biden has left for Hunter that nobody should have ever heard, but you you heard that Joe Biden genuinely loves his son and his heart was breaking. Hunter Biden clearly needs a lot of help. OK, his life has already been destroyed. Why keep pursuing this? Why? The Republicans will destroy Hunter Biden if it means getting Donald Trump reelected and keeping him out of prison. So what did star witness Devin Archer reveal during closed door testimony on Monday? This was the big star witness that was going to blow the Biden crime family wide open. Well, what we learned is what we knew all along, that when it came to Burisma, Hunter was selling the illusion of access to his father. According to Monday's closed door testimony, occasionally Hunter Biden would be in a business meeting and he would call his unsuspecting father and he would put Joe on the speakerphone. And according to the testimony, roughly 20 times over a 10 year period, this is according to Devin Archer, twice a year, Hunter Biden would be in a meeting and he'd call his dad, put him on the speakerphone and they'd discuss the weather, the kids. But that created the illusion of access to Joe Biden, right? And that's what Devin Archer te testified under uh, oath Monday behind closed doors. According to Devin, Archer, uh, Hunter was trying to create the illusion of access to the vice president of the United States. But Devin Archer said Joe Biden never once conducted business on those phone calls or for that matter, really knew who he was talking with other than his son, Hunter. The Republicans will spin this because they must. The truth is. There's no crime, but they have to convince voters there's something there because special counsel Jack Smith's noose is tightening every day around Donald Trump's neck. And the only way Donald Trump stays out of prison is by getting reelected. And the only way Trump can get reelected is if low information voters are convinced both sides are corrupt. That is the job right now of Jim Jordan and James Comer to convince voters that Biden is just as corrupt as Donald Trump. And that's not true. That is just not true. What is true, however, is that Joe Biden has a deeply troubled son who has broken the law. When you owe the IRS one million dollars, which Hunter did, when you lie on filling out an application for a gun permit and say you're not doing crack. Not good. Not good. There's also something unseemly about John Kerry's stepson from Yale hooking up with Devin Archer from Yale and Hunter Biden from Yale Law creating uh, an investment firm. It's unseemly. Like I said, it stinks to high heaven. It's everything that's wrong with the Democratic Party leadership, but it's not a crime. Here's the thing about Devin Archer 
John Kerry's stepson and Hunter Biden, the 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 Yaley tri- triad, I would call them triad, triad, triangle. Let's call them the Yale triangle. Their success, the success of their firm was predicated on the very same thing the Giuliani, Jim Jordan, James Comer investigation of Hunter Biden is predicated upon smoke and mirrors. This is all about smoke and mirrors. The Yale boys built their business on smoke and mirrors and the investigation of Hunter Biden is just smoke and mirrors. You don't have to prove Joe Biden is corrupt. You just need enough smoke and mirrors to convince the American people something doesn't seem right. And that's what Hunter, John Kerry's stepson and Devin Archer, the Yale Triangle, based their business on smoke and mirrors. Hey, we all went to Yale. My dad's a vice president. My stepfather's John Kerry, and he was the Democratic nominee for president in 2004. We have just enough smoke and mirrors to create the illusion that the three of us have access to high level government officials when, in fact, we really don't. They are Hunter Biden is Jackie Jr. in The Sopranos. Jackie Jr. preyed on idiots who automatically assumed because of who Jackie Jr.'s father was that he's connected, but he wasn't. There are enough idiots who believe, who want to believe that Hunter Biden is connected. They want to believe that. They want to believe that Jim, uh, Jim Car- uh, John Kerry's stepson is connected. They're idiots. They're not connected to anybody. Hunter Biden is Jackie Jr. from The Sopranos. If you're trying to squeeze money out of Burisma, headquartered in one of the most corrupt countries in the world, Ukraine, those gangsters in charge of Burisma, because they're idiots, they automatically assume that the American government is just as corrupt as Ukraine's. And it's not. They're going to assume That if you put Hunter Biden on the board of directors of Burisma, he's going to give you access not just to Joe Biden, but the entire American government, because that's how Ukraine works. That's how Russia works. But he's not going to do anything for you other than provide window dressing, which has some value. There's a lot to be said for window dressing. Uh, If you say... We have the vice president of America's son sitting on our board that provides a security blanket to idiot investors who don't know any better. They think, oh, you know, foreign investors who are idiots. The vice president's son is on the board of Burisma. They must have connections. This is uh, this is window dressing. It's how corporate America operates. Before he was Donald Trump's defense secretary, General James Mattis served on the board of directors of Theranos. Remember that company? Elizabeth Holmes, bogus blood testing company. She's now in prison. It's a complete fraud. But General James Mattis sat on the board of directors. The head of Bechtel sat on the board of directors. Uh, You know, uh, They don't know anything. What does James Mattis know about blood testing? He's a former general. He knows how to spill blood, but he doesn't know what to do with it. Can't test it. Uh, But it makes investors feel safe. Henry Kissinger sits on the boards of these big companies. Uh, It's just window dressing. Hunter Biden can't do anything for Burisma. He can't provide access to his dad because it's against the law. And most importantly, Hunter Biden's too stupid to get away with it. It's against the law. And Hunter Biden is a mediocrity who could never have gotten away with it. All he could do with Burisma was convince corrupt gangsters from Ukraine that eh, he's as corrupt as they are. You know, like Jackie Jr. from The Sopranos. So they pay him a lot of money. He takes the money and does nothing for Burisma, the same way General James Mattis did nothing for Theranos. 
you know, the real crime in all this is that Hunter Biden and Devin Archer ripped off those Burisma gangsters. If anything, Hunter Biden should be charged with stealing money from Burisma, taking money on false pretenses. The real victim in all this is Burisma. They fell for Hunter's scam. They fell for it. He convinced innocent, unsuspecting Ukrainian gangsters that he could do something for them. Pay me. I went to Yale Law. My partner's from Yale. And, 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 and uh, you know, our dads are high-level government officials. Uh, we're connected. No, we're not. They, they don't know people. Uh, because the people they know all know that they're idiots and they want nothing to do with them. Nothing. Do you honestly think anyone with real influence and power in America who could actually do something for Burisma is is going to do it through Joe Biden's idiot, crack addict, alcoholic son? No. Unsuspecting Ukrainians thought they bought the lie that Hunter could connect them. And like I said, they're the real victims. And Hunter Biden, he, he owes the United States government a million dollars. He paid that back. I think he should pay Burisma back because he didn't do anything criminal for them. Nothing. Look, Hunter Biden has had a, a tough life. Tougher than some, but not most. There has been tragedy. No, life, uh, no question. No question. Uh, his life has been tougher than some but not most. And Joe Biden made it tougher for Hunter by constantly greasing the shoot for him. That makes your son less of a man. I don't know where we lost the narrative on how to raise sons and daughters in America. When you pull strings for a child, it weakens them. It's why 99% of children born into wealth end up as abject failures. They get everything handed to them, and they don't know what it means to have to work hard because your life depends upon it. Those are the people I want working for me, the people who work hard because their life depends upon it. You want the person who has no options other than working their ass off. I keep saying this. Why would you hire somebody who went to Yale Law School or Harvard or is the son of a vice president or the son of a hedge fund manager? They're worthless pieces of shit. They really are. They're cursed. They're cursed. They, they have a safety net. They don't know what it means to be terrified and that disconnects them from at least half, half the people who live in this country. And that's sinful to do that to your children, to make them so out of touch with normal people in America. When did we forget this? When did we forget this? It has been reported that Hunter was about to get rejected from Yale Law School. His father, Joe Biden, at the time was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. This was 1994, and Hunter was about to get rejected from Yale Law School. So Joe picked up the phone and called the president of the United States, who was Bill Clinton at the time, an esteemed graduate of Yale Law. And it has been reported that Bill Clinton, because he had nothing better to do, got on the phone inside the Oval Office, called the dean of Yale Law School, Guido Calabresi, and asked him to accept Hunter Biden into Yale Law School. It's not illegal. It's unseemly. Unfair to more deserving students and unfair to Hunter. When did we lose the narrative on why this is unfair to Hunter. Nothing good comes from having the president of the United States call your son 
and try to grease the chute so he gets into Yale Law. When you pull strings, you weaken your child. When you pull strings, you weaken your child. Forget that it's undemocratic. It's, it's unfair to your child. It weakens your child. When did Americans forget that? Somewhere along the line, we forgot that. Nepo babies. You have all these defensive Nepo babies now in Hollywood who get very defensive. You don't know how rough I had it. Yeah. Change your last name. Change your last name, Nepo baby. And don't tell anybody who your parents are. Otherwise, you're a Nepo baby. So Guido Calabresi, by the way, and that's the truth. It's the uncomfortable truth that because the narrative is controlled by Nepo babies or their parents in the media, it's unfair. It's unfair to call out Nepo babies. If you're a Nepo baby and you have the same last name as your successful parents, you're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You didn't make it on your own. That goes against the entire American dream of hard work, self-sufficiency, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. In America, you're supposed to be ashamed of inherited wealth. You're supposed to be embarrassed. You didn't make it on your own. You're a piece of shit. Unless, you, unless you're Teddy Kennedy, who acknowledges that he didn't make it on his own and dedicates the rest of his life to giving everyone else the same leg up that he was born with. Okay? But if you're just some actor in Ho some Nepo baby actor in Hollywood, you know, reading for parts and upset because somebody's calling you a Nepo baby, to the core of my very being, let me assure you that I don't know, I know a couple of things to be true about veganism. I know that. I know that if you're a Nepo baby and you haven't changed your last name and you're not trying to level the playing field for everybody else, you're an un-American piece of shit. Okay? And you should have low self-esteem and you should feel bad about yourself, Nepo baby. Okay? You're a piece of shit. And nobody should hire Nepo babies. Nobody. Nobody should hire the children of the wealthy. Nobody. They don't deserve a job. They have inheritances. They've had legs up. Their parents have made the playing field unlevel. Why would you hire a Nepo baby? The only thing you should do with a Nepo baby is say you should have been aborted. You're a piece of shit. You come from shit. Your parents are shit. You're shit. And you're un-American. And if you think I'm, I mean that to the core of my very being. If you want to know who I am, that's what I believe. And I'm right. I'm right about veganism and I'm right about Nepo babies. Anyway, Guido Calabresi, dean of Yale Law School, gets a call from Bill Clinton in 1994 because the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, has nothing better to do than pick up a phone and try to get Hunter Biden into Yale Law School. And Guido Calabresi, dean of Yale Law School, reportedly told Bill Clinton, you know, I love hearing from you, but uh, it would be immoral to intervene. But he was talking to Bill Clinton, who doesn't understand the term immoral. So he kept pushing. Bill kept pushing harder. And so Guido Calabresi, dean of Yale Law, said, OK, I'll tell you what. I'll, you say Hunter Biden's such a great kid. I'll meet with him. So Hunter Biden, who was on the verge of getting rejected from Yale Law, had a meeting with the dean of Yale Law, like all of us 
do when we can't get into Yale Law School, right? This happens for all of us. The, you know, oh, it looks like I'm not going to get into Yale Law. The president of the United States picks up the phone and calls the dean and sets up a meeting for us. That happens. F- f- anybody can just do that. That's what the president is there for, to get you into Yale Law. So there was a meeting between the dean of Yale Law School and Hunter, and it has been reported that the dean of Yale Law School told Hunter Biden, look, you're not getting in this year. Go to Georgetown and then wait a year and let's see if you can transfer into Yale when there's an opening. Uh, I think you'll have an easier chance getting in. Sure enough, less than a year later, Hunter got into Yale Law School. And somehow, miraculously, Guido Calabrese, the dean of Yale Law, at the same exact time, he got to fulfill his lifetime dream of serving on the second district court after Bill Clinton nominated him and the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time, Joe Biden got him right through, right? You got to get confirmed first by the Senate Judiciary Committee and then the entire Senate and the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Joe Biden, helped Guido Calabrese become a federal judge. So let me ask you a question. And I'm not picking on Hunter Biden because I think he's the victim in all this. Would you hire Hunter Biden? Think about this for a second. Knowing what you know now, he comes to you as a a Yale Law School graduate. Now you find out how he got into Yale. Right? It's one of the most selective schools, we're told, in America. But now we're finding out it's not just Hunter Biden. There's been all this reporting in the past week. We're finding out about these elite private colleges, aren't we? Right? Right? We're finding out that these elite private colleges aren't, uh, it's not a meritocracy. They're called elite private colleges because they help the elite. We're discovering that it's all about legacy admissions and how wealthy your parents are. It's the illusion of a meritocracy, the smoke and mirrors of a meritocracy, but it's really for rich kids. It really is. And the occasional minority, the occasional poor kid who they let in, right, to make it look like a meritocracy. Ask Clarence Thomas about his experience at Yale Law School and how that turned him off affirmative action and made him so angry even to this day. So I'm going to ask you again. I would hire Clarence Thomas, but would you hire Hunter Biden? Would you hire John Kerry's stepson? He went to Yale. How'd he get in? Right? They kept asking Clarence Thomas how he got into Yale. Nobody asked. Nobody asked Hunter Biden how he got into Yale. That's the racism that Clarence Thomas confronted. Nobody thought Hunter Biden was unqualified for Yale or Brett Kavanaugh. Nobody said Brett Kavanaugh was ill-equipped for Yale, even though everything was handed to him, went to a $60,000 a year private school, never had to work a day in his life. All he had to do was read. Nobody ever questioned his qualifications, right? Uh, These are mediocrities. I wouldn't hire them. And that they would allow their parents to do that for them speaks volumes to their lack of character. And we see this with Devin Archer, right, who testified before uh, the Republican House Oversight Committee today. Uh, They lack character. Devin Archer, 
Hunter's bot, Hunter's partner, his business partner, ended up going to prison f- for ripping off a Native American tribe. Why do you rip off an American Native American tribe? Because you were raised to take shortcuts to make millions of dollars. We'll take some shortcuts to get you into Yale because that's what these people do. They're 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 entitled. They take shortcuts. Can't get into Yale Law School. Call the president of the United States. He'll make a call. They don't work hard. They don't study. They trade on their family connections, their connections. They make at elite private schools. All of them, all all of these connections make them dumber and more dishonest and less likely to perform the job you pay them to do. Hunter and Devin Archer picked up work with Burisma because American businesses, well, they were on to them. They knew that they were mediocrities. So they got to sit on the board of a Ukrainian gas company because those Ukrainian gangsters were too naive to realize the son of a vice president cannot pull strings for you. So. It's a hoax. Burisma is a hoax. Hunter didn't break the law. He did not break the law. Joe Biden isn't running a crime family because he and his family are too stupid and lazy to pull something like that off. But it is in the best interests of the Republicans to make the Bidens look just as corrupt as Trump. Like I said, this is all political. Burisma is political, nothing criminal. This is all about getting Trump elected president again so he stays out of prison. That's all it is. But like I said, like I said, it speaks volumes to how immoral, not illegal, how immoral our system is. It's smoke and mirrors for the wealthy and the connected. The rest of us have to work hard, but the elite and the children of the elite, they rely on smoke and mirrors. You don't have to be talented or a hard worker if you're a Nepo baby. You just have your parents pull some strings and those strings will provide just enough smoke and mirrors to create the illusion that you're a person of substance. And after a while, you begin to believe you're a person of substance. Again, my heart goes out to Hunter Biden. He's had a tragic life, but his father, his father did him no favors by doing all those favors for him. There are many reasons people become addicts. I wouldn't dare try to figure out why Hunter has the problems he does. There are many reasons people have low self-esteem. I do know when you're dealing with a drug addict, there's only one answer, and that is cut them off. No money, no favors, no strings getting pulled. Unconditional love that brings them to rehab. I wouldn't presume to know what's going on with Hunter or Joe. But I do know this. Success for your children isn't who they know. Success for your children isn't who they meet in elite schools. Success for your children isn't the connections they make for life. Success for your children is providing them substance. A core sense of who they are, and most importantly, what is right and what is wrong. And none of this, none of our time is worth anything unless it's spent helping others, especially the least among us. Sadly, because I am going to vote for Joe Biden, I have no choice. I don't get that those values off the Biden family other than the occasional trip to the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving. Sadly, I don't get it from a lot of high-profile 
Democrats who control the party. The Democratic Party, uh, I have no choice. I'm going to vote for the Democrats. Uh, Biden is better than Trump because the Republican Party are criminal and they're fascists. But the Democratic Party at the tippy tippy top is run by immoral posers. The Pelosi's used to be the Pelosi's, the Schumer's who make their idiot kids. They make sure that their idiot kids all benefit from their connections. Check out Chuck Schumer's kids working for Amazon and Facebook and the son-in-law working for uh one of the big equity. I think it's Blackstone. I think it's Blackstone. Uh, and because it's legal, you see, the Republicans are fascists and criminals. The Democrats are just hypocrites uh, who aren't really breaking the law. But what they do do is they give permission to charlatans like Jimmy Dore and Joe Rogan to get away with saying both parties are corrupt. No, they're not both corrupt. Democrats are just hypocrites. They're not criminals. They're hypocrites. Republicans are criminals. Democrats are hypocrites. Trump, he is a criminal. Joe Biden is a hypocrite. Being a criminal is worse than being a hypocrite. But a party of hypocrites makes it easy to equate them with a party of criminals. Okay? So, let's talk about the Democratic Party before I wrap it up. I'm a Democrat. I would never vote for anybody in the Republican Party. But let me ask you as we're moving forward, why would you vote for any politician, any Democrat, who sends their child to private school? Why would you vote for any Democratic politician who graduated from an elite private school? And I'm not just talking about colleges, okay? I'm talking about middle schools and high schools where the price tag for these sloth farms is anywhere between $25,000 and $60,000 a year plus a donation. Then they hit you up for a donation. Why would you vote for a Democrat who spends 50000 a year to send their idiot kid to a private school, fully aware of what $50,000 would mean for an entire public school, especially one in the inner city? When you spend 50 grand, 50 grand on your own child's education, you're saying, especially to your own kid, that my child's education is worth more than everybody else's. That's anti-democratic. It's un-American. When you spend 50 grand on your own child's education, you're saying, I care more about my child than everybody else's. You're saying, I don't have faith in my kid. I need to give my kid an advantage, a leg up. You're saying, I don't believe in a level playing field. I don't trust my kid to make it on their own. Why would you do that? Especially if you're a Democrat, right? A liberal with your heart in the right place. You would do that because you're an effing hypocrite, not a criminal, just a hypocrite. Why would you spend 50 grand a year to send your kid to a private school knowing what 50 grand could do for an entire school, an entire public school in Compton? Why would you do that? Why would you do that to our country and to your child? Why would you turn your child into a hothouse flower who has no idea 
what the world is really like and spare me your emails telling me that you went to a private school and you spent the summer building up extracurricular activities on a farm in Mexico, learning about the plight of migrant workers in order to prove to the admissions board at Middlebury College that you're a righteous person. You're full of shit. OK, I'm not going to read any comments for any Nepo babies who went to a private school and said you wouldn't believe the public service that's instilled in us at Dalton. Uh, go F yourself. Public fifty thousand. Your parents spend fifty thousand dollars a year to send you to Dalton, where Jeffrey Epstein used to teach your little extracurricular activities. Uh, at an Indian reservation for three weeks to get you into Harvard, that public service you're talking about, the $50,000 would help uh, the, the uh, Native Americans more than your bullshit public service. Okay? Go F yourself if you went to a private school. Go F yourself if you spent $50,000 to send your kid to a private school. Unfortunately... I, I, I'm a Democrat. I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. But this is who runs the Democratic Party. And this is why our party is struggling. It's why we don't have a majority in the House. It's why, even though Joe, uh, 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 Donald Trump is on like his fifth set of indictments, some polls show him winning next November. Why is that? Because Rudy Giuliani, Jim Jordan, Steve Bannon, the Trumps, they know that the Democratic Party, the leadership, has no idea what life is like for the 100 million Americans who could vote but don't vote. That's what the Republicans know. They know that the leadership of the Democratic Party has no idea what it's like to be the people the Democratic Party is supposed to represent. The Democratic Party, the leadership, uh, they'll read books about poverty, but they've never smelled it. And if they did smell it, they never want to smell it again. Again, I'm talking about the leadership of the Democratic Party, not Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush, who Howie Klein had to do a fundraiser for because she needs extra security. I'm not talking about Cori Bush, who represents the people of St. Louis. Cori Bush, Democrat, knows what it's like to be alone and scared, homeless, sleeping in her car with her small children, her voice is the voice of my Democratic Party. OK, Cory Bush, Congresswoman Cory Bush. She's going to save us, not Hakeem Jeffries, not Ro Khanna. What is he worth? Ro Khanna, hundred million dollars. Uh, not any of these millionaire corporate Democrats who think there are two types of people. I always Bring this up. They think there are two types of people, those who wait and those who are waited upon. Ask yourself, do you think there are two types of people? Do you think there are those who wait and those who are waited upon? If you do, get out of the Democratic Party. What do you believe? Do you believe there are two types of people? It sure feels like the Democratic leadership thinks there are two types of people. When you send your kids to elite private schools while quietly amassing millions and millions of dollars, are you serving or are you being served? I don't want my Democratic Party run by people who have servants. Our climate czar, John Kerry, 
can't keep his story straight when it comes to all his private jets. Can't remember. He he flies commercial, but he doesn't know if the private jets owned by his wife, Teresa, whether or not they lease them. And uh, he has no idea how many private jets his family owns. And he's our climate czar. OK, Al Gore, Harvard. Uh, he was right about climate change. Give him credit. But 10 years ago, Al Gore sold Current TV, a liberal news network that he founded. He sold it to Cutter. He took half a billion dollars in petrodollars, took the money from Cutter. Those are petrodollars, petrodo oil money. And uh, he took about four hundred million dollars. Uh, to destroy one of the last remaining left of center political news networks on TV, current TV. He's been sitting on the board of Apple forever. Apple uh, continues to rely on slave labor or, well, you know, they have to put nets around the Foxconn factories to catch the women who jump. Uh, and more importantly, Apple... For decades, I mean, they're getting better, but they've been one of the world's leading producers of greenhouse gases. And if Al Gore isn't on the board of directors of Apple anymore, he certainly owns a lot of stock in that company and uh, not one of our greenest. It's getting there, but not one of our greenest. Again, nothing criminal, nothing criminal. Not like the Trumps, okay? Nothing criminal here, just hypocrisy. It would have been better if Al Gore were president than George W. Bush, because George W. Bush is a war criminal who should be frog marched before The Hague, okay? Al Gore is not a criminal, he's just a hypocrite. And I'll vote for the hypocrite over the criminal. That's why I'm a Democrat. It's run by hypocrites, not criminals. OK, but this is my Democrat, Cory Bush. Very few, very few people come close to Cory Bush. If you're donating money to the Democrats, why would you give it to anyone other than Cory Bush who, who needs extra money for security? Now, this entire Burisma hoax is politics. There's nothing criminal. The Republicans will never expose the Biden crime family because there is no Biden crime family. There's a Trump crime family. The Republicans with Burisma, they're just throwing all this dirt into the eyes of the voters to convince them to make them wonder, to make them think there's possibly some corruption there with Joe Biden and Hunter. Uh, they won't succeed in getting a criminal conviction, but they will expose the hypocrisy in the Democratic Party. And that's why Republicans, despite being so unlikable, that's why they are able to have so much power. Because Democrats are hypocrites, not criminals, hypocrites. And in politics, being a hypocrite is almost as criminal as being a criminal. The people in charge of the Democratic Party, the people in charge, not Cori Bush, not Ted Lieu, right? There are good people in the Democratic Party. Not, I'm talking about the, the problem is with the leadership, their values, right, from the, the Clintons, sadly, the Obamas, the Pelosi's, the Schumer's, the Biden's, their values stink to high heaven. Their va watch how they spend their time. Their values stink to high heaven. And if we succumb 
to the fascists in the Republican Party. It will be because too many Americans have lost faith in the Democrats who are supposed to protect us. Trump is a fascist. He's a criminal. The Republicans are fascists, but the Democrats are elitists. They're run by millionaires who think they're all immune to fascism. They're not. They're not as scared as the rest. The people at the top of the Democratic Party are all millionaires and don't think they're going to suffer too much if we go off the cliff and become fascists. Uh, And the reason America is teetering on the brink of fascism is because we're relying on elitists to protect us. And they can't. The rich won't save us. They never do. The pampered elitists from Ivy League colleges who think their hearts are in the right place, they won't save us. The oil companies, they can't stop climate catastrophe. The millionaires and the billionaires, they can't solve income inequality. The people who own vacation homes can't solve homelessness. Business owners can't solve the rapidly declining power of unions in America. And the graduates of elite private schools that cost as much as 50 grand a year cannot solve America's education crisis. Do not vote for pampered elitists. We need to purge the Democratic Party of pampered elitists. Again, the Republicans are criminal and they're fascists. The Democrats are the party of hypocrites. They're run by hypocrites. And pampered elitists, the pampered elitists who run the Democratic Party, they lack the street smarts to fight fascism. Best case scenario, and I am optimistic, believe it or not, I'm optimistic. This is the best case scenario. Jack Smith, special counsel, locks Trump up and Biden gets reelected. I'm hopeful. I think that's going to I think that's going to happen. But the threat of fascism doesn't disappear with the erasure of Trump. Look at Ron DeSantis. He's the real fascist, more so than Trump. The only way to rid this nation of the threat from fascists is to rid the Democratic Party of elitists. Cory Bush and the Democrats like Cory Bush, that's how you defeat fascism. This is the story we should be talking about. Nearly four million people in America have been cut from Medicaid in the past month. I don't see anybody talking about that. Nobody's talking about Medicare for all. And nobody's talking about climate change, the real solution to climate change. Very few people are talking about the real solution to climate change. Bernie is today. Uh, a couple of senators wrote a letter, including Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, urging Merrick Garland over at the Department of Justice to bring lawsuits against the fossil fuel industry for covering up all the science on climate change. You can go back to the 50s and find documents proving that Exxon knew they were broiling and boiling the planet and it was going to get worse. And instead of doing anything about it, they paid think tanks to produce professors and scientists who deny climate change. We're on the brink of fascism because we're on the brink of something far worse, the complete and utter destruction of our planet. There are three things that we need to be talking about. Income inequality, 
destroying the billionaires, making just making outlawing billionaires, outlawing fossil fuels and locking up the fossil fuel executives, putting them in prison, putting them in prison for lying about the damage they knew they were doing to the planet and Medicare for all and locking up Sir Andrew Witte, the serial killer, the CEO of United Healthcare. The, that's what a Democratic Party has to stand for. Not working with these people, not working with the oil companies to solve climate change, not working with the gun manufacturers to solve school shootings, not working with big pharma the way Obama did uh, with Obamacare, not working with the health insurance companies the way Obama did with Obamacare, not working with the landlords to solve homelessness. Start locking them up because those are the real crimes that are being committed. And if we don't do that, if we don't have a Democratic Party willing to lock up these corporate murderers, we'll teeter and then finally succumb to fascism. All right, let's try. Let's see. Let's see if we can do it. I'm David Feldman, I think, and I have a correction on yesterday's show. I said that the low level Justice Department official who Donald Trump wanted to name as acting attorney general in the waning days of his administration, Jeffrey Clark, was a graduate of Harvard Law. I was incorrect. Jeffrey Clark is a graduate of Harvard College. He earned his law degree, however, from Georgetown, not Harvard Law. I was wrong. And I apologize to all you spastic colons and $5,000 suits wearing Harvard Law degrees on your sleeves. I apologize if I offended you in any way. That was not my intention. My intention was not to offend you. My intention was for you to look in the mirror and realize you're an anti-democratic, sociopathic, intellectual bully who thinks there are two types of people in this world those who wait and those who are waited upon. My intention was not to offend graduates of Harvard Law School. It was to curse their values, the way they are raised and the way they are raising their idiot children. So please accept my apology, Harvard Law School graduates. I was merely trying to point out that you are the cancerous rot in our system. Your self-righteous arrogance provides the intellectual undergirding to murderous elitists who think they deserve to be treated better than the rest of us. I did not in any way mean to offend graduates of Harvard Law. I merely want to curse your very existence as well as your hideous children. I just want to gently help you realize that you should have never been born. That's all. I merely wanted to point out that you and your wives, husbands and wretched, wretched children in their private schools, all of you chase the wrong things and you are incapable of understanding that the cause of your misery, the cause of all your deep rooted unhappiness is the subconscious realization that you are the cause of everyone else's misery and unhappiness. That's all I was trying to say. I did not want to offend any graduates of Harvard Law. I just wanted to gently suggest that nothing good ever comes out of Harvard Law. Just arrogant douchebags who dedicate their lives to charging a lot of money to assist oil companies, health insurance companies and gun manufacturers to get away with murder. I'm just saying Harvard Law graduates are serial killers with manicures. That's all. I don't want to offend anybody who graduated from Harvard Law, which is the lupus permeating the Democratic Party, propping up self-deceiving neoliberals, 
allowing them to think their hearts are in the right place, all the while catering to private equity managers and institutional investors who pretend, pretend to care about unions and the environment, but work behind the scenes decimating the social safety net, good paying jobs with health benefits, as well as the air we breathe and the water we drink. I'm talking about you, Larry Summers. I didn't mean to offend anyone from Harvard Law. I merely wanted to point out that if every Harvard Law School graduate was rounded up by the state, sent to re-education camps for 30 years, and forbidden from ever practicing law again, America could find its way back on the road to recovery. Again, I didn't mean to offend any graduates of Harvard Law. Please accept my deepest apologies. I only wish you permanent kidney stones with no access to morphine. I, I merely wish all Harvard Law School graduates a lifetime of permanent excruciating pain from kidney stones with no morphine. That's all. I just want you writhing in pain forever. Nothing fatal. In fact, I wish you a very, very long life. I wish all Harvard Law School graduates a long, I wish you 120 years of no health issues other than the nonstop, incessant, piercing agony of kidney stones with absolutely no morphine to relieve your misery. Once again, my apologies. Some sad news today. African-American Republicans woke up this morning to discover they are, in fact, African-Americans. It's so sad. It was going so well for some of the leading African-American Republicans in the Senate. All one of them. This morning, the African-American Republican Senate caucus convened a meeting to address their concern over Florida's Republican-controlled Department of Education, mandating that children be taught slavery had its benefits for black people. The entire Republican African-American Senate caucus, that would be Senator Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, who is currently running for president, the entire Republican African-American Republican African-American Senate caucus, that would be uh, Senator Tim Scott, uh, he told reporters in Iowa on Friday that he wholeheartedly objected to Florida middle school students now being taught that slaves develop skills which could be applied for their personal benefit. That standard, that teaching standard, has been implemented by his rival for the Republican presidential nomination, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Senator Tim Scott, the only African-American Republican in the Senate, told an audience of white Republicans in Iowa on Friday that, quote, what slavery was really about was separating families. It was about mutilating humans and even raping their wives. It was just devastating, unquote. That's a quote from Republican Senator and African-American Tim Scott. Wow. Wow. Are you even allowed to say that to a group of white Republicans in Iowa, especially if you're black? I don't think you're allowed to be a black Republican and make white Republicans feel uncomfortable about American history. I got to say, you got to do your job, Senator Tim Scott. As a black Republican, as the only black Republican in the Senate, it is your job to get up in front of white Republicans and lecture all those black people who aren't in the room about personal responsibility. It is your job, Senator Tim Scott, to lecture black people in a room filled with nothing but white Republicans. It is your job to lecture invisible black people you got to lecture them and tell them to stop blaming racism for their station in life. Do your job, Tim Scott. That is the job 
of a black Republican. You need to get up in front of white Republicans and tell invisible black men who aren't in the room, you got to tell them to pull their pants up. Don't steal the pound cake. You need to blame black people for thinking they're being held back because of racism. That's what you're supposed to do, Tim Scott, as the only black Republican in the Senate. You are supposed to make white Republicans feel good by insisting America was never a racist country. That is the job of a black Republican. Your job, Tim Scott, is to convince racists that they're not racists. Do your job. Do you remember your job, Tim Scott? You used to be good at it. And then you started running for president and something happened. Remember last year? Remember the white nationalist, Senator Tim Scott, who shot up a black supermarket in Buffalo last year? Remember that white nationalist who killed all those African-Americans in Buffalo? Remember when you did your job, you said after the shooting, don't point fingers? Guns, go ahead and point those. But don't point fingers at white people. That's what you said. Remember after all those black people were mowed down by a white nationalist in Buffalo, Senator Tim Scott? It was last year when you knew how to do your job as the only black Republican in the Senate. Remember you said America is not a racist country? That's what Republicans are paying you to say, Senator Tim Scott. Your job is to make white racists in the Republican Party feel good. And that was the job description when you signed up for it. Nobody told you it was OK to go off script. Your job as the sole black Republican in the Senate, your job is to soothe the delicate emotional state of fragile white racists. You must bear witness to their emergent inventory of imagined grievances. Now, you expect to get elected president, Tim Scott, telling white Republicans in Iowa that slavery involved the raping of black women and mutilating bodies? Excuse me? You need to talk to Larry Elder. You need to get with the Republican program. You need to start saying America isn't racist. You need to go back to the talking points. You need to say slavery saved the black man. Maybe you need to enroll in a Florida public school and have Ron DeSantis's Board of Education tell you what slavery did for the black man. All of a sudden, Tim Scott is realizing that those white Republicans who laugh nervously at his jokes, even though he's not telling any, all of a sudden, Tim Scott's discovering that all those white Republicans who can't wait to tell him how much they admire him, so long as he doesn't ask to use the bathroom in their home or date their daughters, all of a sudden, Tim Scott's beginning to suspect that deep down inside, deep down inside the entire Republican Party is racist. All of a sudden, he's discovering that now Tim Scott is waking up, dare I say, woke. That's not how it works, Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate. That's not how it works. You know, you don't get to take a job, a six figure job with Exxon and then suddenly say, Hey, you know, we should do something about the ocean, the oceans boiling. Has anybody noticed that the oceans are boiling? No, you're working for Exxon Mobil. Make the oceans boil and shut up. That's what you signed up for, Tim Scott. Suddenly, Tim Scott discovered Nixon's Southern strategy to court the white vote by demonizing black people. All of a sudden, Tim Scott's discovered that Ronald Reagan kicked off his presidential campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the site of one of the civil rights movement's most tragic murders at the hands of the KKK. All of a sudden, Tim Scott's discovering that the Republican Party slashes the social safety net 
by lying, by convincing low information white Republican racists that blacks and only blacks benefit from welfare when in fact more white people per capita are on welfare than black people are. But suddenly Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate, suddenly he's discovering that Republicans figured out a way to lock up more black people by having stiffer sentencing guidelines for crack cocaine than for the regular white cocaine their children snort. Suddenly, Tim Scott's discovering that when Republicans talk law and order, they're not talking about corporate crime. They're talking about black people. Where have you been the last 60 years, Tim Scott? Let me ask you a question, Tim Scott. Did you ever look around the Senate? Have you noticed, Senator Tim Scott, that of all the Republican senators, you're the only one with pigment? You think there might be a reason for that? Have you noticed, Senator Tim Scott, that 90 percent of black people would never vote for a Republican? I don't know. You think there might be a reason for that? You think all those black people who wouldn't step anywhere near a Republican politician, you think they might know something you don't? Have you seen all those cops, white cops, shooting unarmed black men in the back and all your Republican colleagues who call the cops heroes? Did you notice all the Confederate flags on January 6th, Tim Scott? Have you noticed all the white nationalists who support the Republican Party, you know, David Duke, the KKK, neo-Nazis, they all support the Republican Party. Have you noticed, Tim Scott, all those Republicans on Fox News who lie about black people saying that they're genetically predisposed to crime? Have you noticed all those anti-woke purveyors of race science have you noticed they all seem to be Republicans? You think there might be a reason for that? You think? Remember Kyle Rittenhouse, who killed two unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters? Did you ever notice how white Republicans and everybody on Fox News treats Kyle Rittenhouse like he's the second coming of Pat Buchanan? But suddenly, Tim Scott, you're discovering that there's racism in the Republican Party, it's too late. Do your job. You decided to become a black Republican. Do your job. It is your job to make racists feel like they're not racist. That's your job. You're, you're suddenly, you know, you're turning into the stripper who walks out on stage and says, I'm not going to take my clothes off. I'm just going to dance for you tonight. No. That's not what we're paying you for. Take off your clothes. We're not paying you for a sudden surge of dignity and self-respect. Go do that someplace else, not in the Republican Party. Take off your clothes, Tim Scott. Strip. Now is not the time to suddenly lecture your Republican brothers about slavery. They don't want to hear woke propaganda, especially from a black Republican. Now, maybe you forgot the job description, Tim Scott, of a black Republican. So let me remind you, just so we're clear. You, as a black Republican, are supposed to hate black people just as much, if not more so, than white Republicans. It is your job, Tim Scott, to convince white racists that they're not racists because they can point to you and say, how can I be racist? I like Tim Scott, and he's black. I mean, I don't really want to shake his hand, but I like him, so that means I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I like Tim Scott. I hate black people, but I like Tim Scott, so I'm not racist. Suddenly, Tim Scott is speaking out because the state of Florida is defending the enslavement of blacks. Where have you been for the past 60 years, Tim Scott? You know, 
Defending slavery is like the least racist thing Ron DeSantis has done all year. You need to get on the phone with Larry Elder, Tim Scott. He'll set you straight. You are straight, Tim Scott, aren't you? I mean, there's no wife, no girlfriend. Last time I checked, you ran for office claiming you're a virgin who opposed premarital sex. You are straight, right? I mean, I'd hate to think you're that self-loathing, that you're also secretly a member of the LGBTQ community. Look, Senator Tim Scott, I'm just trying to help you. Do your job. Now, you and I know what your game is. You are a mediocrity. You're not an idiot, but you're... You're not Cornell West. You're just okay, which means if you were a Democrat, you'd be another African-American and there's no fast lane to the top for someone like you in the Democratic Party. In the Democratic Party, you're not even a dime a dozen, Tim Scott. Same goes for me. I'm nothing special in the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party looks pretty much like me or you, Tim Scott. They don't need us. But if you're a black man in the Republican Party who rails against affirmative action, well, then you get to be the biggest beneficiary of affirmative action in America. Tim Scott, biggest beneficiary of affirmative action in America because he's a black Republican who's against affirmative action. Put that man out front Make him a senator because he's special, not in the Democratic Party, of course, but in the Republican Party. What's better than a black racist? Give him your love, white people. Look, Tim Scott, you made your pact with the devil. It's too late. It's too late. You're not allowed to tell white Republicans that slavery was America's original sin. Go join the Democratic Party if you want to talk that way. You can't be woke. No woke propaganda in the Republican Party. That's why it's being outlawed in Florida. You can't teach that slavery was bad in Florida because for Republicans, education isn't what people need to know. Education is what makes people feel good. No, Senator Tim Scott the only black Republican in the Senate, you must focus on all the positives of slavery the way Ron DeSantis does. You need to start saying that plantations were technical schools, vocational colleges, where generous white men took time out of their busy schedules to school slaves on sewing, picking cotton, and working with tools. That's all something Africans never would have learned had they not been stacked like lumber onto boats and shipped to America where they were separated from their babies, mothers, fathers, sisters and brothers. And as you pointed out, accidentally raped and mutilated as well as murdered. Anyone who says slavery is a bad thing, they hate America. You don't hate America, do you, Tim Scott? Do you?